Hello, hi, welcome once again to M5's English language learning program, Let's Speak English. I'm Gab Duncan, and I'm here on your TV screen to help you learn English. Now, are you sitting comfortably? Yes? Good. And are you ready for today's lesson? Yes? Good. Okay, well, let's learn English together. Yes, people, it's Monday, the start of a brand new week. A week so brand spankingly new that it's sitting here, mostly untouched by the hand of man, woman, child or cat. Well, all right, I know that cats don't have hands. They've got paws, just like dogs and bears, but not like dolphins. Dolphins have got fins like fish and whales and sharks and seeing as we're here ungulates animals like horses cows sheep and goats they all have hooves and that's a funny singular plural noun one hoof two or more hooves yes the plural is spelt with a v one hoof h-o-o-f but two or more hooves H-O-O-V-E-S. All right, enough about mammals with hooves. It's Monday, so let's get started. So, here we are, and oh my God, I almost forgot. Good Godfrey, I'm terribly sorry. Once again, I forgot protocol. I haven't asked you yet, have I? Oh dear, please accept my apologies. Sorry, okay. Let's remedy the situation. So, before we go any further, how was your weekend? Did you all have a great time? Did you all spend your time usefully? Did you finish your chores, hoover the house, wash the floors, things like that? Did you try to tidy your room? I tried to tidy my t-shirts, but, well, it turned out to be a bit of a mammoth task. It seems that I've got too many t-shirts and they're all piled on top of each other, stacked up higher than the cheese in Alfredo's arms. And, well, they're in a part of a cupboard which is very high up. And because it's so high up, well, that makes it difficult to see what's where. And I can use the ladder to see what's where. But Using a ladder in a small cupboard means that there's not a lot of room to move in. There's not a lot of room to manoeuvre. Have you heard that word before? Manoeuvre? Well, as you can see from the spelling, it comes from French. Just another word that the English language borrowed from another language. But we don't have to worry about that. We're not concerned with the origins of the word, only the meaning. All right, now... The word to manoeuvre can be a noun or a verb. We can talk about a manoeuvre or we can use the verb to manoeuvre. Now, the verb means to skillfully move or carefully move. So, if we say that somebody manoeuvred their car out of a very tight parking space, then we're communicating that this was a very difficult thing to do. There was very little space for them to move their car, but they managed to. They got their car out of a very tight space successfully. If we just say that somebody drove their car out of a parking space, then we're saying that there was nothing special going on. It was a normal parking space. There was lots of room. So? So they just drove out like normal. Think about downhill skiing. Think about when skiers take part in slalom. What they have to do is manoeuvre themselves around the poles or gates. It's something that requires skill. So we can use the verb to manoeuvre. They have to race down the side of a mountain, skillfully moving in and out between poles or gates. They have to skillfully manoeuvre themselves through the gates, turning at high speed whilst they're rocketing down a mountain covered in snow. Sometimes that's down to the tips of the skis being a little sharper than he would have anticipated because the edge obviously goes from tip to tail. So the sharper the tip, the easier the ski bites. So whether he uh, requested that or whether it was a slight oversight by his technician will uh, remain to be seen. Another example is this lorry driver. This lorry driver is skillfully manoeuvring a lorry. 
This isn't just driving or parking. No, this is maneuvering. Okay, so we've learned something new. Now back to something older. What were we looking at last time? Who remembers? I know, I know, you all remember. I was just kidding. Last lesson, as you all recall, we were talking about the two ways that we can use the verb to have, weren't we? We talked about the fact that some people, like me, normally use the verb have together with got. And that means that when we want to form a question in the present simple, we don't use the auxiliary verb to do. The same thing also happens when we're making negative sentences using have got. Unlike most negative sentences in the present simple, when we're making a negative sentence in the present simple using have got, we don't require the auxiliary verb to do. We just add the adverb not, putting it between have and got. All right, so that was that, and now, what's coming up now? Well, we've looked at various bits of grammar connected to the present simple, so, so let's now move on to the present continuous and check that we all know our onions about that tense too. Okay, so, the present continuous, what's that all about? Well, we know, don't we? We know when we use the present simple, we use the present simple for things which happen all the time or sometimes, things in general. We use the present simple to give information about things which don't change. When we tell people where we live, what our jobs are, if we're married or single, what our names are. All of these things are things that don't change. Well, normally they don't change. So that means we use the present simple with them. When we use the present continuous, however, we're talking about something which is happening now, when we're speaking, or around now. I drive a car, but I'm not driving a car now, am I? No, I'm standing in a TV studio, in front of a camera, talking to you. Okay, now we all remember that when we use the present continuous, we often use it to talk about something which is temporary, not permanent. We use the continuous tenses to talk about something which doesn't last very long. If I tell you that it's raining, then we automatically assume that it's not going to rain for years and years and years. It's raining now, but we think, we expect that it's going to stop. It's not permanent. We also use the continuous to talk about temporary situations. I bike to work. My bike's broken, so I'm walking to work. We live in Budapest. I'm living in a small village near Lake Balaton. Okay, so in those two sets of sentences, we can see the difference that I was talking about. I bike to work uses the present simple because we're talking about a habit, a regularly occurring event, something that happens all of the time. In the next sentence, I'm describing a temporary situation. I'm walking to work at this time, happening now or around now, because my bike is broken. This is a temporary situation. Normally, I go to work on my bike, but now, for a few days or maybe a week, we don't know exactly, I'm walking to work. I'm going to work on foot because my bike has got a problem. It isn't working properly. Okay. So we know about the use of the present continuous. What about the form of the tense? How do we form the present continuous? Well, who remembers what we need? Yes, that's right. To make the present continuous, we use the verb to be, correctly conjugated, together with a main verb in the ing form. So, what forms of the verb to be do we know? Yes, that's right. The verb to be has got three forms. Count them. One, two, Three. Three. 
Now let's stomp three times. One, two, three. Ah, ah, ah. Thank you, Count Von Count. Yes, there are three forms. Am, are, and is. If the subject is I, the first person singular, then we use am, I am. If the subject is you, the second person singular, or any of the plural forms, then we use are. You are, we are, you are, and they are. And if the subject of our sentence is the third person singular, then we use is. He is, she is, and it is. All right, so that's the verb to be. Good. Now, we use that verb correctly conjugated for the subject or subject pronoun that we're using, and then we add a verb in the ing form. Now, is there anything we need to watch out for? Yes, there is, isn't there? Yes, when we add the ing ending to some verbs, we have to be careful with the spelling. Yes, it's English spelling coming back into our lives, causing problems like a cactus in one of your socks. When we want to add ing to the end of some verbs, it's very simple. All we do is add ing to the end of the verb. All right, but that won't work with all verbs, will it? No. If the verb we want to use, if the main verb ends in the letter E, then we can't just add ing to the end. No. If the verb ends in E, like the verb to make or the verb to come, for example, we have to remove the E before we add the ing ending. So we have to exercise caution with verbs like bake, make, drive and write. Because all of those verbs end in E, we have to remember to chop off the E before we add the ing ending. So bake becomes baking with no E. Make becomes making with no E. Drive becomes driving with no E. And write becomes writing with no E. I'm, I am, writing a letter to the newspaper. You're, you are, baking bread. He's, he is, driving to work. She's, she is, living with her parents at the moment. The guide dogs, it is guiding the blind man across the zebra crossing. We're, we are, taking the cat to the vet. You're, you are, making a mess with that paint. There, they are, dining at the Ponzi Peacock tonight. Okay, so as we know, that's one area where we have to exercise a little bit of caution. Okay, now what about other problems with spelling? Well, if the verb ends in IE, we also have to be a little bit careful when we make the ing form. If the verb ends in IE, like the verb to lie, or the verb to tie, or the verb to die, then we have to remove the IE ending and replace it with Y before we add the ING ending. So we replace the IA ending with Y and then add ING. Or if you want to think of it another way, we take off the IE and add YING. So lie becomes lying, tie changes to tying, and die becomes dying. Now, this group is a small group. There really aren't that many verbs in the English language which end in IE. So it's not going to cause us too many problems. He's not dying at the moment. I'm tying my shoelaces. They're lying on my bed. All right, any more? Any more areas where we need to exercise caution? Well, yes. We've just looked at the spelling situation with vowels, but we also need to think about the situation with consonants too. But that'll have to wait because, yes, you know what I'm going to say, don't you? Yes, that time has come around once more. The end of the lesson has appeared. Old Father Time is standing in the corner tapping his hourglass. And we know that it's the signal for us to head out of the door. I'm off home for a coffee. And as for you lot, well, there's the dog, the cat and the parrot. There might be some chores waiting for you to do. Perhaps it's your turn to hoover the living room, or maybe you've got to clean your shoes. I don't know what you have to do, but I do know this. Whatever you're doing, have fun doing it. If you're not having fun, then you're doing it wrong.
Remember to check the website out. That's where we store the vocab, and I'll see you all tomorrow. Same time, same place, but tomorrow. See you tomorrow. See you all later. Bye.